Welcome, and thank you for joining the National WIC Association in celebration of Black Maternal Health Week. Black Maternal Health Week is a week-long campaign founded and led by Black Mamas Matter Alliance. It's an annual event that takes place during April 11th through the 17th. The campaign is aimed at building awareness, activism, and community building to amplify voices, perspectives, and lived experiences of Black mamas and birthing people. This year's theme is Our Bodies Belong to Us, Restoring Black Autonomy and Joy. Black maternal health is a pressing issue in the United States. Black women are three to four more times likely to die of pregnancy-related complications when compared to white women. And this disparity persists regardless of income, education, and other socioeconomic factors. The Special Supplement and Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, also referred to as WIC, is a federal assistance program that provides nutrition, education, healthy food, and other support to low-income pregnant women, new mothers, and young children. WIC has the potential to be a powerful tool in addressing Black maternal health disparities. By providing nutritious foods and education on healthy eating habits, WIC can help improve health outcomes for Black pregnant people and postpartum women. However, access to WIC is not always equitable. Black women are less likely than white women to enroll in the program, and even when they do enroll, they may face barriers such as stigma, transportation issues, and biases. It's important to recognize that WIC is just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to addressing maternal health disparities. Other interventions such as improving access to quality health care and addressing systemic racism and discrimination are also necessary to create lasting change. It is my absolute honor to welcome a true leader in addressing the Black maternal health crisis in this country to join me today in an armchair discussion. Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Congresswoman Underwood represents Illinois' 14th Congressional District. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from the University of Michigan and later earned a Master of Science in Nursing with a focus on health policy and administration from Johns Hopkins University. She worked as a registered nurse and health policy advisor prior to joining Congress including serving as senior advisor at the Department of Health and Human Services under President Barack Obama. In 2018, Underwood was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, becoming the first woman, person of color, and millennial to represent Illinois' 14th Congressional District. She currently serves on the House Committee on Appropriations, including the Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee, where she has been a tireless champion of WIC. She is also co-founder and co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus and a self-described lifelong Girl Scout. During today's discussion, we will get more into her role as a fierce champion for demanding change when it comes to addressing disparities in maternal health, including serving as the lead congressional sponsor and writer of the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. Congresswoman Underwood, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Jamila. I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation to join this important discussion. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I have been looking forward to this event for several weeks now. Um, and really just want to thank you so much for your tireless um, efforts and support for Black maternal health in Congress and a true icon in my eyes. So the first question that I wanted to get into today is just to mention, you know, being the first woman, person of color, and millennial to represent Illinois' 14th congressional district is so, so impressive. Tell us about how you came to be a congressional leader and what inspired you to get on this path. Well, thank you so much. You're too kind. This all started way back in third grade when I was diagnosed with a heart condition. And the health care that I received from my medical team really inspired me to go into nursing. And when I was an undergrad, I had the great fortune of being a Congressional Black Caucus intern in the office of Senator Obama. And I learned so much um, from the senators, staff, but also just being in proximity with these huge leaders and giants in our country who um, were really inspirational to me to understand what representative democracy really meant. And so um, I served in the president's administration, as you noted, and really was inspired to run for office after attending a town hall that my congressman hosted in the spring of 2017 during the time of Obamacare repeal. You probably remember there are many different versions of repeal that they were considering. And my congressman said he was only going to support a version that let people with pre-existing conditions keep their health care coverage. So obviously, that really was meaningful to me. And I took him at his word. But two weeks later, he voted for the American Health Care Act, which was the version of repeal that did the opposite. It really made it cost prohibitive for people like me to get coverage. And I got mad and I was like, I'm running. <laughs> and I launched a campaign and jumped into a primary. I beat six guys. And then I beat that four term Tea Party Republican congressman in November of 18, becoming the youngest black woman to ever serve in the Congress. Wow, that is so amazing and, and so inspiring on so many levels. You know, leave it up to women to, to you know, figure out that things need to get done um, and, and go run for something. And, you know, so much to be proud of there um, with your background and, and your story. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so just to shift now to talk about, you know, the Black maternal health crisis in this country. And, you know, just a few weeks ago, the CDC released, you know, new rates um, when it comes to our Black maternal health crisis, or our maternal health crisis as a whole in this country. And those new rates show that we've actually seen a 40% spike in maternal deaths um, with little progress in closing the entrenched racial disparities that we see um, with this crisis. What factors contribute to the sharp racial disparities that we see in maternal health, especially among Black and Indigenous women? You know, this data was like a gut punch because in many ways it validates what we've been saying for so long that the crisis is getting worse, it's getting worse. You know, we know that COVID obviously exacerbated a lot, but, you know, when I think about overall, we can see some clinical and non-clinical drivers of maternal death in this country, or as we call them, adverse maternal health outcomes. And so we're talking about things that are barriers to accessing health care. So thinking about workforce shortages, and hospital closures. Uh, we see extensive bias and racism in the delivery of maternity care and throughout society in our country. Um, obviously, we know that the social determinants of health, like housing, like transportation, and especially like nutrition, um, are really leading contributing factors in these adverse maternal health outcomes. And, you know, this association, the National WIC Association, has been a tremendous leader in lifting up the role of uh, nutrition in um, improving maternal health outcomes. And then obviously, we're very concerned about maternal mental health conditions and substance use disorders as driving up uh, maternal death in this country. Thank you so much for that. You know, so much of this also has to do with, you know, the experiences, particularly that, you know, Black women and other women of color um, have when it comes to their interactions with the healthcare system. Um, mm -hmm. And the omnibus is such a robust piece of legislation, and it, it touches on so many different aspects of that experience. And um, part of that is also thinking through, you know, quality health care, you know, mm -hmm. how systemic racism shows up in the context of those interactions with, you know, health 
staff, professional staff, as well as those in the front and back office, which is something we tend to talk about a lot in our work as advocates in this space. Can you talk a little bit more about those experiences, um, you know, that Black women in particular tend to face when it comes to interacting with the healthcare system? You know, us talking about racism as a factor here is not just a figment of our imaginations. We know that Black women not only share their stories, um, you know, their families share their stories. And research also shows that this is something that consistently happens, regardless mm -hmm. of our economic background, how much education we have. So share a little bit more about, um, you know, this power imbalance that we see in terms of the healthcare system between Black women and, and their providers. Well, I think we need to be really specific here. So we see implicit bias where a provider may not be aware that they're treating different patients differently, um, you know, really being sympathetic and responsive to one individual's uh, complaints of pain and completely dismissive of somebody else's. But for them, they're not conscious of it. And so it, we call that implicit bias. Then we have explicit bias, aka racism, and both are highly problematic and both are leading to adverse maternal health outcomes in our country. And so we have to have solutions and interventions designed to address both. So we see healthcare systems really embrace uh, the idea of implicit bias training. Um, you know, we see them really embracing them as these trainings as meaningful tools to uh, expand the consciousness of the workforce and make sure that, you know, there's consistency at implementation so that um, everybody within, you know, a certain specialty or provider type is receiving this training and they really see it as making an institution type investment in addressing these disparities. I'm not here to discourage anybody from having those tough conversations about the role of implicit bias in contributing to health disparities in this country. However, we cannot stop there. The healthcare, the healthcare sector must also be willing to have that same kind of frank discussion about explicit bias racism. Um, we know that Black moms are dying at three to four times the rate of white moms. We know that for every death, we have 70, seven zero near misses. And the scope of this problem is enormous. There is nothing wrong with the moms, right? There's nothing like inherently wrong with Black women. We're talking about racism, which is baked into our healthcare systems. And we have to see healthcare institutions being equally as committed to changing. And so part of the the intervention that we are trying to support healthcare systems with through the Momnibus is to diversify um, our healthcare providers so that uh, we call it a perinatal workforce. So more OBs and midwives and nurse midwives and lactation consultants and doulas, right? So that that workforce reflects the communities that they serve so that every person, every mom can have a choice in their providers. Um, and then, you know, when we take a step back from what's going on just in the healthcare sector, we have to look at what's going on at society at large. Uh, for example, we know that there have been, you know, some kind of legacy impacts of policy decisions over generations that has led to Black people being exposed to greater levels of environmental contaminants. Recent studies have shown that um, these environmental contaminants are leading to adverse outcomes for both Black moms and Black babies. And so within the Momnibus, we have a bill that I've introduced called the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act to address air pollutants, extreme heat, and other climate change related risks um, through community-based investments, right? That's how we get to some of these larger systemic societal problems. We have to confront them head on. The healthcare sector has an opportunity to lead in this regard, but they have to be courageous and committed to doing so. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you, you know, sort of bringing out the need to grow and diversify the perinatal workforce. I mean, obviously, this is such a central piece of the Momnibus and also something that we're thinking about here at NWA when it comes to diversifying um, the WIC workforce as well. We know that in order to best serve the communities most impacted, uh, you know, it's important for clients and patients to see themselves reflected in those that are working in these programs. So thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, and so me being the policy wonk 
punk that I am, um, I want to take a step back and talk about development of the momnibus. And, um, you know, I just have to mention it was it was a highlight of my career, you know, working with you and your team to to come up with the idea for the momnibus and think about play around with different iterations and what bills were we going to include. And I don't know, I feel like we probably had, you know, I mean, it was probably upwards of almost 100 different topics that we had sort of gone through and talked through, including, and obviously, um, you know, it didn't work for us to include all of those, but, you know, the process has been so iterative, you know, even as we introduced different versions of this, we started off with nine bills and, and then we had 12, um, the last congressional session, and then you're in the process now of thinking through what the next iteration is going to look like. Just talk to, to us a little bit about that process and the excitement behind and, you know, developing the Black Maternal Health Monibus, which has become such an important vehicle, not only when it comes to advocacy on these issues, but it has really been the impetus for us moving along so many different aspects of addressing this crisis through different mechanisms, whether it's thinking about, you know, language and appropriations legislation, um, states and localities introducing their own monibus bills, you know, um, activists organizing around the momnibus. There's just so much to share about this, but share a little bit about, you know, your experience, um, you know, when it came to some of those initial conversations and developing a piece of legislation like this. Well, Jamila, I want to first start by thanking you for being the tremendous thought partner, uh, source of encouragement. <laughs> um, you know, you have been like day one, uh, helping us navigate this process when we were, you know, brand new and just eager to make a difference. And so just thank you for being you and being kind and being so helpful and responsive. Um, when I was wrapping up my federal service in the Obama administration, a good girlfriend of mine, um, Dr. Shalon Irving, was preparing to deliver uh, her first child, a beautiful baby girl named Soleil. And then three weeks later in 2017, she died of complications uh, related to high blood pressure. Now, Shalon's death was devastating. I remember going to her funeral and the director of the CDC, Shalon was a um, commission corps officer uh, working at CDC. She, The director came and said, we just don't understand how this could happen. And I was like, are you serious? We know exactly how this happens. Um, because in our community, in this country, it happens far too often. And so as I was making the decision to run for Congress, I knew that if I were to be so fortunate to get elected, this would be an issue I wanted to work on. So when I got to Washington, I was assigned to the Education and Labor Committee, and I reached out to Congresswoman Alma Adams for a meeting. She was a senior member of the committee, and I just wanted to see if there was any areas that we could work on together. And she shared a passion and commitment to addressing uh, maternal mortality issues. Um, she's had she's told the story a lot about the challenges that her daughter Janelle had um, in her pregnancy and delivery experiences. And so Congresswoman Adams and I teamed up, uh, and we called ourselves the Black Maternal Health Caucus because in Congress you just give yourself a name, right? And I literally. Thought thought, Jamila, that it was just going to be the two of us working on this issue, but we had an announcement planned. And the day that we announced the caucus, the House Majority Leader stood with us. Senior members across the Congress stood with us and a bunch of advocates came. And I was just like, wow, it, it caught me by surprise. And then the phone wouldn't stop ringing. We got inundated with outreach from provider groups and experts and community leaders from across the country interested in being involved with our work. Out of that came a stakeholder summit in the summer of 19. Uh, and then we had this long list, Jamila, you're right, of like all these policy ideas that we needed to distill. And so my team and I, including the great Jack, um, who I think everybody in the space knows, Jack, um, really synthesized it down to what became the Momnibus in March of 2020, literally like 10 days before everything shut down with COVID. Um, 
me, Congresswoman Adams, then Senator Harris, Kamala Harris was our lead Senate sponsor. We introduced this bill. And then the pandemic came and changed everything because data emerged so quickly that said that the COVID-19 virus um, in Black and Hispanic moms were leading to some really adverse maternal health outcomes. And so we knew we needed to start writing some new bills. And so we added in two related to COVID, the mat uh, Maternal Pandemic Response Act, I think Maternal Health Pandemic Response Act and the Maternal Vaccination Act. And then we added in the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Act as well. And so that's how we got to 12. But it's been a great journey. Um, we're working to reintroduce. Um, and I think this month it's coming out. And uh, we are so committed to getting the Momnibus across the finish line. We've had some early successes. Our Momnibus bill to help veterans moms was signed into law. Um, but we need the whole thing. <laughs> we need the whole thing to be signed into law so we can save mom's lives. Absolutely. And it's it's so interesting as you were sitting there, you know, sort of running through all of the different pieces of that experience. I remember the big event that we had on Capitol Hill, you know, we first introduced the Momnibus, which was, I think it was the day before everything shut down, <laughs> to be honest. And I remember working together to try to figure out, well, you know, should we go ahead with this event? You know, what are we going to do? And, and we went ahead and we had the event everything was wonderful. And, and we had great success to pack room. And then, you know, literally the next day, you know, everything was shut down. So um, I think that was also just the beginning of, um, you know, I, I feel like our advocacy, like really ramped up after that. I mean, you know, during the pandemic, um, you know, we know that COVID rates, you know, did have a, a particularly harmful impact on pregnant women um, and birthing people and how the community sort of shifted and, and, you know, refocused in a lot of ways to center those experience as well as coming up with policy solutions um, that would help address this issue in that context was nothing short of amazing. And so um, lots of great memories there. And I'm even more excited about this next chapter because we have had a lot of, um, you know, things I think to be proud of. We've seen so much movement around postpartum coverage extension, which is also centrally a central aspect of our broader sort of advocacy and, and policy efforts around addressing um, the maternal health crisis in this country. And, um, you know, but we still have so much more to do and it's such an, an important moment. Um, so thank you for, for running us through all of that excitement. Um, and so I do want to shift a little bit and talk a little bit more about nutrition and WIC and the context of um, maternal health in this country. Um, so for the first time in nearly a decade, we've seen USDA um, undergo a rulemaking process basically to update um, the food packages that are a part of the WIC program. Um, you know, these updates would permanently expand the value of the WIC benefit largely through an increase in fruit and vegetable benefits. Um, and Representative Underwood, you've been a huge champion for this through the appropriations process. What does it mean for families and how will this build on nutrition security and health equity in Black communities? Well, studies have shown that food insecurity is significantly associated with pregnancy complications, including gestational diabetes. And so with Black women more likely to face food insecurity, this issue is a direct threat to maternal health outcomes. And so we're really focused on improving nutrition security before, during, and after pregnancy. Um, and we know that with that type of investment, we'll improve outcomes for Black moms and families. Um, and it's important to also remember we have to prioritize uh, nutrition security for the whole family since moms will often prioritize the health and nutrition of their children above themselves. And so that's why the WIC food packages tailored to the specific needs of moms and their children so vital. But it also just illustrates why um, we need to protect and strengthen SNAP and school nutrition programs as well, right? Like, uh, we should not have families going hungry in this country, particularly during these vulnerable periods. Um, you know, postpartum periods, for example, newborn infants and throughout their formative childhood years. And so I really see these revived foods packages as um, 
an expression of that value that we hold as the American people. And just to follow up that, I mean, we also know that, um, you know, there's going to be an end to the SNAP emergency allotments and continuous coverage of Medicaid. And you know that this could potentially be catastrophic for, you know, millions of families in this country, you know, the same families that are also, you know, able to benefit um, from WIC as well. And so can you talk a little bit more about just in terms of like both the, the healthcare system, the nutrition system, just, just all of these sort of different facets when it comes to when we think about the social safety net for yeah. these families. I mean, how, how can providers, including WIC providers, step up to help families meet basic, you know, holistic needs in a moment like this? So, you know, you're right. We started this with the American Rescue Plan and through the annual appropriations process, we've been able to greatly increase the value of these benefits. So for the WIC food and vegetable benefit, it's increased its value by three to four times. And so we're seeing a greater amount of fruit and vegetable consumption among WIC enrolled children. Um, and, you know, what we're trying to do is make this permanent. Um, and I think that then that helps as we look to kind of mitigate some of the challenges with these pandemic era enhancements um, going away. So the Department of Health and Human Services has estimated that approximately 15 million people are at risk of losing their health care coverage because the Medicaid continuous enrollment provision is coming to an end when the public health emergency ends. And so within those 15 million people, it's estimated that nearly 7 million would still be eligible for Medicaid coverage, but then the remaining enrollees would have to take up other options. So healthcare through the marketplace, um, where thanks to my legislation, plans are now more affordable than ever before. So visit healthcare.gov if this applies to you. Um, but I would just say to prevent significant coverage losses, we need to take every step that we can to connect with people who might be at risk of losing their coverage. Um, and you know, make sure that we're helping them re-enroll or find another type of coverage. And, you know, sometimes it's as simple of, as like updating contact information, um, but it's really important that WIC providers get involved and step up and really help guide people through this process. Uh, WIC providers are seeing people regularly and they have, you know, really established relationships and trust built uh, with this population that you know, is going to be directly impacted. Um, but I would also welcome your thoughts, Jamila, on how WIC providers can most efficiently support people at risk of losing their Medicaid and SNAP benefits, um, because, you know, you're the expert here on all of this. Well, thank you for that, Lauren. You know, it's, it's, such a difficult moment, right? You know, as you were sitting there talking, I was just thinking about, you know, key examples from, you know, some of our state and local WIC staff where, you know, there's really an effort to, um, you know, sort of implement one stop shop, um, you know, solutions when it comes to helping families sign up with, you know, the various public benefits that they qualify for, you know, um, where they can sign up for, you know, they're coming into the WIC office, you know, to sign up for WIC, but there's also the opportunity for them to get linked up to Medicaid um, and staff benefits as well, as well as other um, benefits there. But it's not something that we're seeing across the board that every state and locality has been able to take up. And this is something that we talked a lot about, you know, sort of in some of the initial, um, you know, just ideas around addressing maternal health in this country, right? How can we make it easy as possible, you know, for families to sign up for the benefits that they need, knowing that it's it's not just, it doesn't rest with healthcare, you know, that's an essential piece of it, or it doesn't rest with WIC. There are also all of these other um, essential needs that families have. But then, you know, I also hear from some WIC providers, you know, that everything can't be on them, you know, as well. And so it's really a process of thinking through how we can strengthen 
really the social safety net and support system as a whole to really help meet the needs of families. And, you know, being able to sign up for benefits online um, has been another key aspect of this. Um, and that is something that we've seen really expand, um, you know, during the public health emergency under COVID. And again, another um, flexibility that we're hoping, you know, will be extended in this moment. So lots of ideas out there for how this can work for families. And we have to keep the conversation going, right? I mean, and, and I think it's so important too, to have policymakers such as yourself who are so passionate about this. And in everything that you do, you're centering the, the families in this country um, and their needs. And so really appreciate um, your thoughts on this. Um, so I also want to talk about the Medicaid coverage extension, you know, postpartum coverage extension, which is something that, um, you know, has also been an essential tool in the toolbox, um, you know, so I should say when it comes to our work around addressing the maternal health crisis, you know, as you mentioned, you know, under the American Rescue Plan, um, the Biden-Harris administration um, was clear about sort of setting priorities um, mm -hmm. to make it um, be an option for states to extend this coverage, um, you know, for moms across the country. And we've seen more states take it up since then, um, and which is very exciting. And can you talk a little bit more about the impact of this? You know, we know that particularly, um, you know, Medicaid is such an important option, particularly for, you know, families of color in this country, you know, where they're accessing their healthcare through Medicaid. Um, and previously, we've seen, you know, this this policy where, you know, after two months of, of being on Medicaid, you know, through the pregnancy pathway, moms are essentially dropped from their health care coverage. And so we've been working tirelessly over the past you know, few years to get this policy change to be permanent where moms can actually keep that coverage up to a year um, after giving birth. So tell me about what you think the impact of this is going to be on the maternal health crisis. Yes. So, you know, if we could only do one thing, right, um, making the postpartum Medicaid expansion permanent and mandatory across the states is that singular intervention. Now, why? Um, because the Medicaid program pays for about half of all deliveries in this country, but it pays for at least two thirds of the deliveries for Black families. And so um, if we can ensure that mom and baby are having coverage throughout that full year long postpartum period, then we have more of an opportunity uh, to deliver appropriate healthcare interventions should uh, something bad happen, right? And so that's why this is such a priority. So as you mentioned, during the in the American Rescue Plan, uh, we created the state plan option that would allow states to expand postpartum Medicaid coverage from 60 days to a full year. And then we made that a permanent option for states um, in the funding package that was enacted at the end of 2022. So this work was led by Congresswoman Robin Kelly, my colleague from Illinois, and it's a critical policy, um, but we need to make it mandatory. <laughs> and so we're, we're really laser focused on this. Um, right now we have 30 states plus DC, uh, that has followed Illinois' lead in getting this done. Um, but, you know, Jamila, you've really just led so much research in this area. And as your research has shown, um, losing coverage in the postpartum period can also lead to barriers in accessing maternal mental health care and doula services. It can also lead to mismanagement of chronic health conditions. And so by extending postpartum coverage, uh, every mom can get the health care and support that they need and deserve. And we need every state to just get on board and take up this life-saving evidence-based option. Absolutely. Um, and thank you so much for, for bringing up research um, that I have done in the past on this issue. I also think it's important to note, too, particularly, you know, we know that um, maternal mental health conditions, you know, mm -hmm. are a leading cause of death, um, you know, in this country, pregnancy related death. And so, um, you know, based on the research that I have done in the past, you know, looking at, um, you know, sort of options for extending coverage, um, you know, at the state level, we know that even just the mere fact of, of losing that coverage means that you're, you don't have 
continued access to the essential health care services you need. You know, as Lauren mentioned, whether it's family planning services, um, maternal mental health care, addressing substance use disorders, and that in and of itself is a source of stress for new moms, you know, who are also grappling with, um, you know, meeting their breastfeeding goals, childcare issues, returning to work, um, caring for other family members. Um, and so this is really an issue. And, you know, we've called it low hanging fruit over, over the past, you know, a few years, but at the same time, you know, here we are, we've made some progress, you know, it is an option and we've seen more states take it up, but it really needs to be permanent um, and mandatory for, for all states. Um, you know, it's, it's just so critical to ensure that moms have that continuous healthcare coverage. And to be quite honest, it just makes sense. You know, most of these deaths are happening, you know, after, um, you know, well after, um, you know, two months of, of giving birth. And so it's really essential that, you know, this is, um, you know, an option for all women, no matter where they live. And so, um, thank you so much, um, Lauren, for, for talking us through that. Um, and so, you know, I also want to talk about, you know, we've talked about the momnibus and, you know, even talked about all the stakeholders that, you know, have come to the table with us, both in terms of, you know, members of Congress, as well as advocates and activists from across the country. Um, you know, we've had healthcare providers at the table, doulas, midwives, Mm -hmm. activists, um, you know, just, you know, folks from across the board, researchers, um, you know, who have really been so passionate about this issue and really working to move it along. Um, you know, and Rep Underwood, you've been so dedicated to this as, as we've talked about so much today, you know, who else needs to come to the table? Um, who are we not talking to or, or bringing along um, when it comes to this issue that we should be? You know, I think that more and more people understand that just on a basic values level that in 2023, moms shouldn't be dying related to pregnancy related complications. Um, but there's some people who feel the freedom to look away when mm -hmm. uh, they think that it's only one group of people that's impacted, right? So just black moms or just Hispanic moms or just Native American moms or just moms that live in rural areas. And, and what we have been trying to do is make sure that people understand that with these investments, the quality of healthcare improves for everybody. And um, I think that is an important conversation piece as we're talking about this, right? We want to center the experience of those most impacted while also recognizing the universal impact of the intervention. Um, and in this time when we're seeing, you know, attacks on um, reproductive freedom, we know that there are many individuals who are seeking solutions to help support moms. And this is the solution to help support moms and prevent um, preventable maternal death. 80% um, of the deaths in this country are preventable. And so this is the kind of conversation that we are beginning to have with the Black Maternal Health Caucus. I think that this type of conversation using inclusive language, um, really taking out any um, feelings of, you know, it's not about me, right? This is about bringing people in and inviting people in to join our advocacy and to join our work and, and meeting those folks where they are in both language and approach and tone and and even, you know, inviting CEOs and executives to join the conversation um, and inviting folks who may not present to the world as Black women to, to lead some of the conversation in certain places is going to be really important for us to be successful in our advocacy. You know, we are focused on getting this legislation across the finish line, which means we have to be flexible and expansive in our thinking um, in order to overcome some of these, what I would call persistent legislative hurdles, i.e. the United States Senate. So we're going to do that. And um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to make some new friends along the way. Um, but there's definitely, I would say, an expansion in the works. Um, the Black Maternal Health Caucus from the very beginning has been bipartisan. And the folks that have joined the caucus from the Republican side of the aisle often have deeply personal 
reasons for joining us and they are very committed to the work. They might talk about it differently. They might lead with different types of examples and they might embrace very different interventions that we support than what I would embrace, um, but it doesn't make their commitment any less. And so I would just say there's a lot of people who care about the work that we're doing and the impact we'll have in their communities. And it's our job to help them feel welcome as part of our movement. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, and, um, you know, just to ask you, I know that the the next iteration of the Momnibus has not yet been introduced. And I just want to say that. Yes, that is correct. Um, and, you know, the team here at NWA has had such an important role in, in really leading the charge and working with your team to, to include provisions related to the WIC program um, in the legislation, um, including extending Medicaid, um, you know, postpartum coverage, um, extending the WIC um, eligibility period as well to two years in the postpartum period, um, as well as some other provisions there. And so just wanted to ask if you could give us a little preview or taste of anything related to, you know, this next iteration, or even just, you know, a little nugget about, you know, what you're really excited about when it comes to this next version of the Momnibus. Okay, well, first of all, low key obsessed about uh, the WIC expansion. We have come so close to getting this WIC expansion across the finish line. So listen, friends, I know this group knows, but right now, WIC cuts off six months postpartum for mom, 12 months for baby, but we're trying to get it to 24 months for both. Can y'all imagine the difference that that will make uh, for families in this country? It will be huge. There is enormous, I would say, bipartisan support for this type of change. It's just not free. And I think that that is where sometimes we run into some trouble. And so the way that we talk about this and just being really candid about the impact in each of our communities needs to be part of the advocacy discussions um, that your membership engages in all the time, because um, the support is there. We just need to get it across the finish line. Now, when we think about what's up next for the mom of us, I'm very excited because, you know, we're going to come back with our 12 bills, uh, a little bit refreshed, um, but it's going to be what you've come to love and appreciate from the mom of us. But then we're also working on mom of us, too. And mom of us, too, is going to be everything that has gone under researched or under resource related to maternal health or women's health or reproductive health. Um, but that's not leading to maternal death the way that everything in the momnibus was about maternal mortality. So thinking about things like fibroids, endometriosis, intimate partner violence, uh, IVF, like fertility related issues, stillbirth, miscarriage, right? Y'all see what I'm talking about. So I am very excited about Momnibus 2. Uh, we're working on it. We're in this idea stage once again. So, oh, menopause. We're working on menopause because I sometimes leave that out and people are very quick to remind me that we need to uh, have a lifespan approach, which is important. And um, I'm excited. So the work continues, but we are very committed to getting the mountain of us across the finish line this calendar year. Shall I be so bold to say um, we are not letting up, we're not being deterred. And I think we can get it done with your help. Well, it sounds so exciting. I actually got chills when you were sort of sitting there talking through all of those pieces. And I love the fact that the direction is sort of shifting into this like broader holistic look at women's health, which I think is so important and essential to the conversation around maternal health as a whole. You know, women's health is, is can be complex, you know, mm -hmm. and we have so many different stages of our health. And um, it sounds like, again, you know, we're in for a bold um, approach to this issue. And, you know, just so thankful for, for all of your leadership on this issue and for continuing to be our champion. You know, it, I sleep 
better at night knowing that you are up there on the hill, um, you know, marching in those halls and, and advocating for us. And so just thank you so much um, for your work. Um, so with that, um, I think we are going to close. Um, thank you so much to the audience for joining us. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you to the marvelous Lauren Underwood for being here today. Um, and just also want to tell our listeners, you know, the this is Black Maternal Health Week. Um, continue to support and engage when it comes to the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. Um, during Black Maternal Health Week, follow the conversation on social media using the hashtag BMHW2023 um, and attend events both virtually and in person if it's safe across the country. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.